This week we travel to Paris to make three desserts you may not have heard of. The first is very simple, it's a rustic apple cake. Sliced apples in a cake batter in a springform pan. Then blogger David Leibovitz shows up at Mostry to make a salted butter caramel mousse that's absolutely incredible. And finally, inspired by the Rose Bakery in Paris, we do a chocolate orange tart with a pat in the pan crust. So stay tuned for the desserts from Paris here at Milk Street. Funding for this series was provided by the following. Ferguson's proud to support Milk Street and culinary crusaders everywhere. For more information on our extensive collection of kitchen products, we're on the web at fergusonshowrooms.com. For 25 years, Consumer Cellular's goal has been to provide wireless service that helps people communicate and connect. We offer a variety of no-contract plans, and our U.S.-based customer service team can help find one that fits you. To learn more, visit ConsumerCellular.tv. Cooking happens in the kitchen, but life happens around the kitchen table. The 1919 Collection, celebrating yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Visit us at www.1919cookware.com. You know, French apple cake is one of those whatever recipes, right? Because it's French, and the French are kind of like, yeah, whatever, like n'importe, you know, like, who cares, or tant pis, too bad. They smoke a cigarette and look bored if you ask them about what goes into a recipe like French apple cake. So it's basically a cake batter and some apples. You throw it together and bake it. That's not too hard. The problem is apples are not apples. Some of them have a lot of liquid, some not, and it tends to sog out the cake. So we found a recipe we like from Dory Greenspan. We thought that was one of the better ones, but we still wanted to make a few changes, yeah. Erica, yeah. and uh, you few. made some changes. <laughs> the biggest change we made was we decided to pre-cook our apples, and that had two advantages, one of which was to rid the apples of a lot of their moisture so our cake didn't become too soggy, and the other advantage is that when you cook apples, they shrink down in size, and we can add extra apples to our cake. Very American yeah. of us, yes. <laughs> and for our cake, we liked one sweet and one tart. For the tart, we used a pound and a half of Granny Smith's, and for the sweet, we used a pound of Golden Delicious. I'm just Which gonna... is, by the way, the apple they use in France. It is a very French, for most yes. Of their pastry. We felt it needed a little bit of more of that tartness. That may be American of us too. I don't know. Being tart. <laughs> I'm just going to peel these. Have you ever peeled an apple before? <laughs> And now we're gonna cut these into slices. I like to square out the core. So I cut off one side, and then I just put it down on its flat side, and I cut around the core. And then I just like to cut it into quarter inch slices. So you can see that's a lot of apples that's gonna go into this cake. But before we cook these, actually, we're gonna do one other thing, brown our butter too. And I have eight tablespoons of salted butter, and I'm gonna go ahead and just cook this on medium heat. And you don't want to walk away, but you want to be here. You want to swirl the pan because we don't want it to burn. That sizzling means all the water is coming out of the butter. You can see, Chris, it's foaming now. And when you slide the pan like that, you can see those milk solids are getting nice and brown. They're going to just pour this out into a bowl. And normally, I would scrape that out. I would not leave any of that goodness behind. But we're actually going to use that to cook the apples in. Before we do that, though, we're just going to add a quarter teaspoon of ground allspice into the butter to sort of bring out its flavor and toast it in that hot butter. So I'm just gonna whisk that. Okay, so now we're ready to cook our apples. Go ahead and put them right in the pan. We're gonna add two tablespoons of white sugar and a half a teaspoon of kosher salt. Both of these obviously add flavor, but they also help to draw out the moisture. We're gonna turn it up to medium high. If they start to get too brown, we don't really wanna caramelize them. You can turn the heat down a little bit, that's fine. Yeah, I, I've made this cake, and you do want to stir fairly frequently because yeah. the, the ones at the bottom will get pretty dark. They'll fast. get dark, yeah. and they'll get they'll get start to get mushy. They'll get overcooked, and this is going to take about 12 to 15 minutes. Okay, Chris, these look great. So we're going to do one last delicious thing, and that is we're going to add two tablespoons of brandy. It's going to deglaze the pan to get any caramelized bits. We want to cook it off a little bit just to get rid of that sharp bite. This is going to cook for about a minute. I think I'd use a quarter cup. <laughs> 
I mean, you if would. you're gonna make it good, yeah. make yeah. it better. Just do it, yeah. And then we're gonna go ahead and put these in the fridge for about 15 to 20 minutes to cool down, and then we'll make our batter. Okay, Chris, so our apples are nice and cool. We can go ahead and mix the batter. It's a very simple batter. It takes, you know, just a few seconds to whip together. That's why I love this dessert, because it's such an easy way to showcase fall apples, if you've got a lot of them on your hands. So we're gonna start off with 2 thirds of a cup of all-purpose flour. We're just gonna add to that a teaspoon of baking powder. Just gonna whisk that together. And now we're gonna start with two large eggs. We're gonna add nine tablespoons of white sugar, and then two teaspoons of vanilla extract. Okay, now we're gonna add the brown butter that's cooled off. And I like to add this a little bit slowly to give it a chance to emulsify with the eggs. And I like to scrape the bits. Mm, I think there's a lot, good. yeah, there's yeah. a lot of flavor in there. You don't wanna leave that behind. We're gonna go ahead and add our dry ingredients. And I'm gonna stir that in. Now you're gonna notice it's gonna become a fairly thick batter, but we don't need it to be thin because we do have, you know, the moist apples, they still have moisture in them. And they're gonna go in and really make this a moist cake which really I find sort of toes the line between custard and cake. Which line do you live Which on? is a good thing. Are you on the cake <laughs> side or are you well, on the it's custard a, it's side? A tough, it's a tough call. I kind of like being right in the middle. You want it to be not creamy, but you know, just sort of have that slight custardy quality. So you can see it's pretty thick. We're gonna add our apples. Just gonna scrape those in. Just gonna stir this in enough to coat the apples. So this is very different than apple pie. Apple it's pie, a lot yeah. easier. And like I said, I love that you can cram so many apples into it. And it is, it's, a, it's much less work. And now I'm gonna go ahead and transfer this over to our prepared pan. We're using a nine inch spring form pan for this. It's been buttered and floured. And the reason we use a spring form pan is this cake is a little too fragile to be able to turn out of a, of a regular cake pan. I'm just gonna push that into an even layer. And the last step, we're just gonna sprinkle another tablespoon of white sugar on top, and we're ready to go into the oven. We're gonna bake this in a 375 degree oven on the middle rack, and it's gonna take about 35 to 40 minutes. You don't wanna underbake this kind of cake. You wanna make sure that it's cooked all the way through. It's gonna get a nice dark brown color on top or a deeply browned color, and then it'll be done. Okay, Chris, so this has been cooling for a good two hours, and that's important because, again, you need to give this cake time to set up. So I'm just gonna run a knife around the edge to loosen it, take the sides off. That looks great. It has a nice golden brown color on top, and I'm really excited to cut into this. A couple of those plates. I'm gonna use this, just it's kind of a delicate cake. Okay, and we have some creme fraiche here. Shall we just look at it for a moment? I don't know, I think I'm ready to. Dig in. Oh, okay. <laughs> Th this is clearly not a whatever dessert, though, I have to say. Hmm. Oh, boy, is that good. It's soft and it's tender, but it's not mushy. It's not soggy. Mm. It's also not too sweet. Yeah, and the creme fraiche is nice with it as well to curb any kind of sweetness. One more, a little bite. <laughs> You're doing a good job. I am. I'm beating you. <laughs> you are. Is it a race? <laughs> oh, delicious. So I started out by saying this is a whatever cake, but this is not a whatever cake. This is it's hard to curb your enthusiasm cake. It goes together in about 15 or 20 minutes. Just pop it in the oven, it's done in an hour. I'm here with David Leibovitz, food blogger extraordinaire. You've been in Paris since 2003. Mm -hmm. Also author of two great books, My Paris Kitchen. We're doing my favorite recipe from the book uh, in just a minute and also La Part, which is the trials and tribulations of finding, renovating, buying, and then living in an apartment in Paris. We're gonna do a salted butter caramel chocolate mousse. Are you one of these guys who like has these long recipe titles? Well, French, everything's a little more descriptive, oh. I should say. So it's not just chocolate mousse, it's mousse au chocolat. So au caramel au beurre salé. This is just a dry caramel, which means I'm cooking the sugar without any liquid, without any water. A lot of recipes have like two parts sugar to one part water, whatever right. it is. Why are you not adding water? Well, sometimes when you make a caramel with water, all these little sugar crystals are still in there, and there's a lot more water, and they're all moving around, and the sugar crystals start hooking up with each other, kind of like a bar. Oh. People will eventually start hooking up, and then they start getting crystallization. So you first start to see a color change and melting around the edges, right? Right, you can see yeah. it's starting to burn there. So I'm gonna stir this up a bit. So you wanna use a spatula, one of these silicone spatulas. They're really great because they can be heated to 475. 
You want to use your senses here and see when it's done, smell when it's done. And you can smell the caramels just starting to burn. And that's when we're going to turn it off and then add salted butter. And that's one of my favorite mm. smells. You know, a lot of people think French people just eat French food. Well, what's French? You know, is pesto French? Pistou? It's pesto, it's Italian. Cassoulet, where the beans from, they're from Central America. And, and the French had a lot of experience in North Africa, right? Yeah, foie gras is Egyptian. So a lot of these foods that people think are French are actually part of this great mix. And of course, Paris is a wait, melting wait, wait, pot. Wait, wait, foie gras is Egyptian? Yeah, so that's, it was I didn't a, know that. it's Egyptian. Yeah. Huh. I want to write about the real Paris, you know, the multicultural neighborhoods, you know, maybe the service, you have a bad service experience. Those are funny. Someone saying, oh, I went to Paris and everything was great. I'm like, oh. They go, oh, we went to the market and, you know, this lady tried to cut in front of us. I'm like, oh, really? You know, and I love those stories. So we've got our salted butter caramel here, and it's very easy. It's just a two-ingredient recipe. So while it's off the heat, we're going to go ahead and add some heavy cream. So a lot of caramel recipes say use a, let's say, a two-quart saucepan that's narrower. Mm. I actually like to use a skillet because it's got more surface area. When the sugar's much thicker, it doesn't melt as evenly. So once all the caramel's melted, I'm going to go ahead and add the chocolate. It's bittersweet chocolate. You can use semi-sweet. Actually, the nomenclature is not really important. You don't need to go to town whisking chocolate. Chocolate melts very easily. That's why we love it so much. It also tastes really good. Yeah, I was going to say, I didn't believe a word of that. You, you love chocolate because it melts easily? That's great. That's... There we go. That was incredibly easy. So now you're going to let it cool and then add egg yolks? Right, we want to let it cool to about room temperature. So to help it cool down, we're going to pour it into a bowl. The, the French are known as frugal, of course. Is that really true when they yes. cook? Yes, very uh, frugal, which is good. When I went to pastry school in France, like for example, this pan, they would, I would have gotten yelled at for leaving some chocolate behind. So I want to make sure I get all of it out there. And I'm like that too, so I fit right in. So we're going to add the four egg yolks. Just get them stirred in well. And we'll set those aside while we whip the whites. I actually like whipping whites by hand. Do you want to do something? Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Tom Sawyer, for that. I really appreciate that. But I can tell you've whipped a lot of egg whites. I have. So we're going to take some of this, and this is one of my favorite ingredients. This changes everything in the kitchen. This is called fleur de sel, which means flour of salt. It's harvested on the Atlantic coast of France. And what happens is during the summer, when the wind blows along the marshes, it sort of forms this salty crust on top. In the old days, it used to be women that came along. They're called paludiers. And they would take these rakes and rake off this fine layer of fleur de sel. And it was always women because they said that men were too brutal. Women had the right touch to cultivate this beautiful salt. And I'm just going to whip this in. One thing you have to realize about France, it's not the place where the customer is always right. You can't go in and customize the menu. So when you go into a restaurant in Paris, don't, don't try to get them to do something that they don't do. Go in and order the steak with the potatoes. Don't ask if you can get the potatoes without the butter. Just order something else. You're there to enjoy what they have to eat. I wouldn't go to come to your house and go, oh, I want something else. So we've got our egg whites here. So we're going to add about a third of the egg whites into the chocolate just to lighten it up. And I'm turning the bowl as I mix. I'm not beating the heck out of this, you'll notice. I'm folding it over. We could take a taste test just to make sure it's okay. Or we can just go ahead and put it in these lovely little jam jars that you've, you've got here. So you can use these to fill the jars. If you have a canning funnel, they work really well as well. So it has the big round hole, not yeah. the small one? Yeah. And then what we want to do is refrigerate these for about eight hours. Why eight hours? That seems like a long time. What happens is the mousse needs to set up. It needs to that, get really cold so it has that foamy texture that we love about chocolate mousse. So is it also true, I, I know that I was there a couple years ago, if you get acquainted with someone just by going back to the same yes. place, is that a good thing to do? I tell people who are coming to Paris, they go, we want to go to this cheese shop, this cheese shop. I like, go to the one near where you're staying and go there every day. Because there's an expression, the first time you're a stranger, the second time you're a guest, the third time your friends or family. The French are very convivial. There's an image that they're not nice, or that they're abrupt, and they can be that way just like Americans can be. But they can be wonderful and warm, especially when you get to know them. So we've got our chilled mousses here all set to go. And they're perfectly set up. We each get our own little individual serving, which is great because we don't have to share. Because you don't like to share. We don't have to share. That. It has that wonderful sort of sticky mousse texture. That's mm. light foam. 
Yep, that's um. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> that's not bad. It's silky, but it's also got a little more substance to it. So, David, thank you. You came all the way from Paris to make me dessert. It was worth it. I'm deeply grateful. Uh, it. Salted butter, caramel, chocolate mousse. Not a man of few words, evidently. But that's okay. that's very French. Well, you told me it was one of your all-time favorite desserts, so I'm very uh, touched and moved. I've, so I'm I, very impressed. My Paris Kitchen is a great book, and this is my favorite recipe, and I've made it a number of times. So, cheers. Cheers. Thanks. You know, when you go to Paris, and I know you've been there more than once, uh, one of the smart things you can do is have a very light lunch. So I recommend the Rose Bakery. It's in the 9th, which is right down from Place Pigalle, which in the old days was sort of like the old time square. And you can have uh, some soup for lunch or a piece of quiche, or you could have an assiette de legumes, there's a vegetable plate, and a glass of wine. It's very nice. But what is great about Rose Bakery are the desserts. Mm -hmm. And you have individual little tarts. There was a chocolate orange tart, which we're going to make now. Pistachio cakes, burnt sugar. Oh, those are good, too. So Rose Cararini uh, started Rose Bakery. She's British. And so we're going to take her idea, a chocolate orange tart, bring it back to Mill Street, mm -hmm. uh, and make it for you now. And so how do we great. do it? Well, we do it by starting with a very easy dough. This dough was inspired by the pat sucre, which means it's a dough that has a little bit of sugar in it. This is the first step in the easiness part. We have one cup of all-purpose flour, half a cup of almond flour, one third of a cup of white sugar, a half a teaspoon of kosher salt. So now we're going to process those just to get them blended. Great, about five seconds is all we need. Then we have six tablespoons of cold salted butter that we've cut into half inch cubes and kept chilled until we need them. We want to process this about 20 to 30 seconds. We want the butter to be incorporated fully so there's a coarse sandy texture, but not clumpy. Alrighty. We have one egg yolk and we have one teaspoon of vanilla extract. And it should take 20 to 30 seconds overall. Okay. Then we're going to let it go. See how at the bottom is starting, to, uh, mm -hmm. starting to pull together? That's what you want. Okay, so that was number one easy. Here's the second thing that's easy about this dough. Just dump it in the pan? Exactly, we're not rolling it out. We're gonna spread it evenly a little bit. Now we need to flatten this out and we're gonna use this measuring cup. So what I like to do is start in the middle, very lightly at first. You know, I'm gonna take this off of here for now. It looks like it's not coming together, but trust me, it is. Sort of like kids in their 20s, you know? <laughs> they don't look like they're coming together, but they will. They just wait long enough. <laughs> there we go. Now, as you get to the edge, we're gonna go back and press and push down on the top. This is about the extent. This Actually, this is the extent of the effort you're gonna have to physically put into this dough. Look at that. There we go. Then we're gonna take our fork, pierce it all over. This just helps prevent air bubbles from bubbling up underneath and um, buckling the dough. And don't forget the sides. Do you see? The shape of this dough, as it is now, this is going to be the shape of the dough when it comes out of the oven. So it's not going to shrink. Which it's not is going the... to shrink, and it's not even going to slump. My whole career has been based upon avoiding slumping with pie dough, and this dough solves the problem. Yes, no slump dough. No slump dough. <laughs> so we're going to freeze this for 15 minutes to an hour to let the butter and the dough firm up again before we put it in the oven. And the one thing about baking it, this dough has given us so many gifts and how easy it is to make. The one gift we give the dough is time in the oven. We're gonna preheat it to 300 degrees before it comes out of the freezer so it's fully preheated. And then the dough bakes for an hour to an hour mm. and a quarter, but it's worth it, it's worth it. The sugar has a chance to evenly brown and caramelize and the entire dough is a beautiful, even golden color. And the texture is, it's hard to describe. Divine, it's so good, it's hard to describe. And just showing there's never a free lunch. You have to give back a little bit. Okay, Always into the freezer. Into the freezer we go. Our tart just came out of the oven. It's baked for an hour, hour and a quarter. And look at the color. I thought you were going to say it didn't slump. Man, well, I, well, the color yeah, first. The color is beautiful. You, all right. Well, you always do slump, color first. You, you do, do color slump, before right? anything else. <laughs> okay, beautiful color and it didn't slump. Okay. And no pie weights. No pie weights. Okay. Absolutely. So let's make the filling. We're going to start with six tablespoons of sugar, two teaspoons of freshly grated orange zest, half a teaspoon of kosher salt, and a quarter teaspoon of ground cinnamon. We're going to blend those ingredients together. Just a few pulses. Beautiful. This is whole milk ricotta. It's 12 ounces. 
and the whole milk part is important for the rich creamy texture of this filling. But if you need to spackle your walls, you could buy a lot of skim ricotta and yes. use it for that. <laughs> We tested a lot of different brands of ricotta, and we found that the one that gave the most beautifully even color tone was Calabro. Okay. So if you can find that, all the better. It should take about 30 seconds. Great. So you wanna blend that until it's completely smooth. And we have one yolk and one whole egg. Two tablespoons of orange juice and one teaspoon of vanilla extract. So this mirrors the flavors that are in the crust, but it's distinct from the orange. So we process that until smooth, about 10 to 15 seconds is all it takes. Now we are gonna talk about the chocolate, because it is a chocolate orange tart after all. We're using semi-sweet chocolate, one and a half ounces. Now there are a lot of different ways to incorporate the chocolate within this tart, and we tried several of them. And what we decided on was to chop the chocolate in quarter inch pieces. I always like to use a serrated knife for that. I just find it cuts through the chocolate a lot easier with less spatter all over the board. No, I like the spatter on the board because then you can <laughs> eat the pieces that fall right, off right. the board. Exactly. I mean, so you, you want to start with like three ounces and you get down to an ounce and a half. Right. That would be fine. <laughs> okay, so that's about it. Some are chunky, some are shardy, and that's exactly what we want. And they settle on the tops and they give the most beautiful speckled appearance. Do you like this recipe? I, I can't... I, <laughs> I wasn't sure. Uh, you know, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, yeah. The shell is still warm, which is good. You can't put the filling in right away? No. You have to wait how long? Well, we want to wait at least 15 minutes, okay. but you do want it to still have some warmth on it. You don't want to put it in hot because then you get a little bit of harsh cooking, yes. Good. Pour it right in. So I'm going to fill the crust and spread the filling level, and then we're ready to put the chocolate on top. Why don't you take some too? To eat. <laughs> You're right. Maybe I shouldn't have let you get near this chocolate. <laughs> so we've adjusted the temperature of the oven to 350 degrees, and we're going to bake the tart for 25 to 30 minutes. We're happy here <laughs> at Mill Street because we've arrived at this lovely tart. It's pretty stunning, yeah, isn't it? it is. Right. Now, when we took it out of the oven, the center was still jiggly, as it's supposed to be, because it does continue to bake as it sits and cools. And, and here's a tip, by the way. When you cook a tart like this, a custard tart, in the last minute or two or three minutes, things happen really fast. Yes. So in the last 10 minutes of baking, you want to check it almost every minute. But now it's time to eat. Yes, it has been two hours. So we're going to remove it from the pan. And this may be... The next to the last gift that this crust gives us is that it is firm enough to handle it without fear, but in your mouth, that's going to be the final gift. You notice I waited the 10 seconds before you had your base. Was, I was going to say, you picked up the plate, but you did wait. Amazing self-control. I mean, look, the look of the crust is, is baked all the way through. It's got a delicate texture. Go right ahead. And, uh, I did. And it's, this tarp, I have to say. Amazing. Uh, okay. It can be eaten cold as well. It keeps beautifully in the refrigerator for a couple of days. But definitely try it warm and cold because both of those things are just. Oh, yeah. Like this is going to be around in two days? I don't. Well, there's that. This is unbelievable. Mm. You know, my guess is if you serve this at home, there'd just be no talking for five minutes. <laughs> you know when people really like them, they put their heads down and they don't make eye contact because mm -hmm. they don't want anybody to have any of their piece? Right. Yeah, that's what happens. Mm. So here's the recipe you want to put in your repertoire from Milk Street, the chocolate orange tart. It starts with a pat in the pan crust that needs no weights for pre-baking. It does not shrink and browns up really nicely. And the filling comes together very simply in a food processor. It goes into the warm tart, into the oven for about 25 minutes until it's just jiggles in the center. Chocolate orange char, you can get this recipe, all the recipes from this season of Milk Street, at MilkStreetTV.com. Funding for this series was provided by the following. Ferguson's Proud to Support Milk Street and Culinary Crusaders Everywhere. For more information on our extensive collection of kitchen products, we're on the web at fergusonshowrooms.com. For 25 years, Consumer Cellular has been offering no-contract wireless plans designed to help people do more of what they like. Our U.S.-based customer service team can help find a plan that fits you. To learn more, visit consumercellular.tv. Cooking happens in the kitchen, but life happens around the kitchen table. 
The 1919 Collection, celebrating yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Visit us at www.1919cookware.com. So here's the menu, churro first, and then squid sandwich. It's hot, it's crispy, it's delicious. <laughs>